isn't it? I have a sister that's in hospital right now, just found out she has stage four pancreatic cancer, and I saw her just a few weeks ago on Father's Day, and she seemed fine. So we cannot boast about tomorrow. We do not know what tomorrow will bring, right? So as I was thinking about her, um, probably doesn't have a lot of time left. So um, anyway, ladies make every day count for eternity, right? We want our life to be uh, for the Lord. All right, well, I am looking forward to being here. It's a little more crowded than last year. So uh, I don't know how we can squeeze very more in, but uh, it is good to be here among friends and uh, got to meet some of you that I've either been discipling on the phone or have talked to or emailed and you came up to the table and said, hey, I'm that person. So thank you. It's such a joy uh, to meet people face to face. I know what Paul says when he says, I long to see you face to face that I may impart some spiritual gift unto you. So uh, all those times he was in prison yet long to see the people face to face. There is something different about face to face, isn't it? All those live streaming, my husband calls it lame streaming. Um, <laughs> That's about what it is, right? And being face-to-face is glorious and wonderful. So our dear sister Karen has already mentioned our theme this weekend is Lessons Learned, uh, taken from Romans 15.4, which says whatever things were written in earlier times were written for our learning, that we, through the patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And so I hope that's what happens this weekend. I hope that you will be filled with comfort, and, uh, but also admonishment. These sisters that we're going to be looking at also have some lessons learned for us that will be in the form of admonishment. Beware. You don't want to be like her in some areas. We want to be like some of them, but some of them we don't want to follow. So, right? so first of all, we're going to consider Eve. She was the seduced sister, and you might have thought, well, that's kind of a strong term. But not really. When you think of what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, he says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And so we know that anything that is not of God is of the devil. And we know that it was the serpent who what? Deceived her. He wholly seduced her. And not in an immoral way, but in a biblical way. So we're going to consider her first. And then after our break, we're going to look at our submissive sister, Sarah. And uh, look at First Peter 3. And what does a submissive woman look like? What attitudes and characteristics should we possess? And uh, I didn't get the uh, little acrostic to Karen in time, but uh, the Lord helped me to put that in the acrostic submit. Everything's in an acrostic tonight, right? So you have no excuses uh, for not remembering these lessons that you have to learn because they're very uh, uh, skilled in acrostic. So we have Eve, we have submit. And then tomorrow morning, we're, I hope none of you are like Yodia and Syndike, the squabbling sisters. Uh, they were squabbling, so much so that Paul has to tell the whole whole church at Philippi to get together and help these women. And so ladies, we're not exempt from disagreements, but we need to learn to get along with one another. And so we, uh, in the form of the acrostic squabbling, I'm going to give you some tips on how to avoid squabbles, okay? So uh, when you go home tomorrow and see your husband, you'll never squabble again, right? (laughs) Uh, Then after that, uh, one of the lessons Karen asked me last night at a dinner we had, which lesson had really impacted me, and I think the steadfast sister, the Shunammite woman, when she had just found out her uh, son had died, and uh, we see the steadfastness of this woman during a very difficult trial. And uh, so for me, it was a a really blessing to go through that lesson, the Shunammite woman. And so we're going to look at the acrostic steadfast. What can we learn from our steadfast sister? And then last but not least, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to look at Dorcas. You might call her Tabitha. Tabitha, who was called Dorcas. And remember, she's the one that died and Peter rose uh, her, her from life, from death to life. And so she's our serving sister. Remember when she died, all the women came around, they were crying, you know, we can't live our life without Dorcas. 
And so she must have been some woman. And so we're going to look at her tomorrow, and we're going to look at our serving sister, and we'll have a little acrostic works, because ladies, that's what service to the Lord is, right? We, we are ordained before the foundation of the world for good works. Every one of you in this room who has made Jesus Lord of your life, you have works to do that God has foreordained for you to do. And so I hope that you are uh, doing those. And if not, well, then maybe after our final lesson, you'll discover what your spiritual gifts are and use those for the glory of God. That would be uh, my desire. And I know it's the Lord's desire for you. So uh, for tonight, I just want to give you a, a full warning before we get started. You're going to need your Bible this weekend, and uh, we're going to be going a little bit of everywhere. I'm, in fact, Debbie said, I'm kind of interested in hearing this. She travels, you know, we've traveled for over 20 years together, and she goes, I'm kind of interested in this weekend because I'm not used to you doing uh, more topical things. You know, you just kind of go through a couple of passages in Scripture. We're going to go through the Scriptures, but it's going to be a little bit different than uh, well, at least what she's accustomed to. So uh, have your Bible ready, and I hope that you're ready to uh, get in into God's Word and learn some lessons. So for our first session, you will probably need to go ahead and turn to Genesis, where we find our seduced sister Eve, and we're going to uh, consider three, three lessons, three principles we can learn from her in the acrostic Eve, E-V-E. -E. But before we get started, uh, let's pray and uh, give this time to the Lord. Oh, Father in heaven, we come to you with hearts full of thankfulness. We just sang that. Our hearts are full of thankfulness, Lord. We are so thankful that you have saved us, that you have called us out of darkness into light. We thank you that even though our mother Eve was seduced, wholly seduced by the evil one, that you... Uh, Lord, in your graciousness and your kindness, you sent us a Savior to save us from our sins. Lord, even though sin entered into the world by one man, Adam, Father, even so, there is by, by your Son, Jesus Christ, we have been saved from sin. I do pray, O oh Father, that as we open your word this evening, that you will give us insight and wisdom. I pray that you will give us understanding. I pray that we will be warned from this sister and Lord as to how avoid the, the, the ploys of the evil one. And Father, I pray that you would remove the, the difficulties, the distractions, the travels of the day, the, the discouragements of the day, the problems of the day, Lord, so that we can do what is really necessary, and that is to sit at your feet, to learn, to worship, to fellowship with like-minded sisters in Christ. And so, Father, we give this time to you for your glory. May you be seen. May you be lifted up. May Christ be the one that is preeminently worshiped this weekend, and no woman, Lord, only Christ alone. And it's in his name I pray, amen. amen. Well, imagine this. Imagine living in a world where there is no sin. Sounds great, doesn't it? Imagine in living in a world where no one gets sick. There's no such thing as a COVID pandemic. Imagine that. Imagine a world where no one gets murdered, there's no rapes, there's no robberies, there's no sexual abuse, there's no physical abuse, not even verbal abuse, there's no strife, anger, jealousy, no envy. Imagine a world like that. That'd be pretty good, huh? Imagine a world where even the animal world all gets along with each other. You know, dogs and cats, and they all get along. And, and uh, in fact, even humans get along with the animals, and the animals get along with the humans. That'd be pretty good, right? Don't have to worry about the lions and the snakes attacking you. And imagine a world where every human being is in intimate communion with their creator, with God. There's never any separation from him. We can always communicate with him. We have constant fellowship with him and enjoyment with our creator. Imagine this. Wouldn't that be great? Ladies, this was the world before sin. This was the world before sin. This was the world before our mother Eve, the mother of all living, was deceived, and then she enticed her husband to disobey God. 
It's hard for us to imagine this world, isn't it? Because as we sit here tonight in the year 2021, we open up the news or we open up on our phone or turn on the television and we don't see a world like this, do we? In fact, we see now, according to what I just read, the crime rate in the United States, it's the worst it's ever been in its history. Some states are up 400%. So we see not only robberies and rapes and all those things, murders, but we're seeing an increase in them. And even Florida, the beautiful state of Florida, just had a condo that completely collapsed. Those are the kinds of things we read. And we're reading about immigrants from other countries flowing in at an all-time high. And many of those are convicted felons. Far from a perfect world, isn't it? We could go on and on on what's going on in the news. But ladies, the world we live in now was not the world that God created. This was not the world that God intended for his children to enjoy. And so for us to understand what happened there in the garden, what happened to Eve when she was wholly seduced, and the things that we can learn from her, we need to look in the beginning. So I hope you have your Bibles open to Genesis 1, because we're going to look at our mother Eve, the mother of all living, and see three principles we can learn from her. In Genesis chapter 1, you know what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And remember, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so God divided, remember, the light from the darkness, and then he also divided the firmaments from uh, the heavens, and he made the earth. And remember, he called the the earth, or the land earth, and the, the gathering together of the seas, uh, he called um, the seas, uh, the gathering of the waters he called the seas, and I'm not going to read all of it, but the other thing God made, he made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. So he's making all these things. He gives light, he gives darkness, he gives two lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night, and he's making all these things, and then he creates the animal world, every living creature, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, everything that moves on the earth. He creates all these living Living beings, and he blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas. And so, after God had made all these things, he spoke, there was light. He spoke, there were animals. He spoke all these things into existence. And he divided the the land from the seas, from the earth, from the heavens. And then, after all this, He said, let us make man in our image, our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl, over the air, and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. They will have, they will be able to rule these animals. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. And what did he tell them? be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In fact, it says at the end of chapter one, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was good, right? It was good. This was, man, an amazing, beautiful place to live in. Everything was going great. And then in chapter two, verse seven, we see the Lord God formed man out of the dust of ground breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And he planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man there whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for the food, the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Look at verse 16. This is very important. And the Lord God commanded the man, said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it, for in the day you eat it you will surely die. And the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone, I will make a helper for him. And so out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the air, the field, and every bird, and brought them to Adam to see what Adam would call him, whatever Adam called him. That was their name. And he gave names to all the animals. And look at verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman 
and brought her to the man. And Adam said what? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because why? She was taken out of man. And here we see a principle. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave as to his wife and the two will be made one flesh. And it says the man and woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now, as I mentioned, you have an outline there before you. And as we're going to study Eve tonight, we're going to see three aspects regarding her life. And as I said, they're an easy acrostic for you to remember. Three lessons learned, E-V-E. The first thing we know about Eve is the first E on your acrostic, obviously. That's not too hard to figure out, right? She had extraordinary beauty. Extraordinary beauty. Ladies, think about it. Eve is different than any woman that has ever lived. You know why? She was not birthed from a human mother. Every one of you in here has a mother. Every woman we're going to study this weekend has a mother. Everyone in the Bible except Eve. In fact, it's interesting. Her Hebrew name means giver of life. Giver of life. And Eve was extraordinary in every way. God created this woman to be the ideal woman. Her beauty must have been unsurpassed. In fact, one man thinks that in heaven, that her beauty in heaven will be more glorious than her beauty here on earth. Now, I don't know that to be a fact. It doesn't say in the text, but could be. But ladies, imagine how she must have been. She was perfect before the fall. Perfect beauty, perfect charm, perfect grace, perfect strength, perfect femininity, perfect wife. You know, who wouldn't want a wife like Eve, right? And what do we know about her from Scripture? Well, we know she was made from Adam. In fact, the word made literally means God built a woman. God built a woman. And he did this by what? Causing a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he took a rib from his side to form her. Now, at this time, Eve isn't given a name. She's just called woman. Some people say, whoa, man. Whoa, man. <laughs> Maybe that was her name. Whoa, man. <laughs> what is this creature? And that's what her husband called her before her sin. So she was perfect in every way, and she complimented Adam in every way. She was his companion. She was his helper. And may I stop and say here that being your husband's helper does not mean, as some have taken it to mean, that all you do is have his babies and darn his socks. That's an old word, you know, mend his sock. Who does that anymore? Uh, when I was growing up, my mother actually, you know, she instead of throwing the socks in the trash, she actually, what they called, darned them, you know, put them together. Those are part of our God-given role. But ladies, Eve was made to help Adam emotionally, spiritually, and physically. In fact, uh, someone asked my husband one time, who holds you accountable? And he said, are you kidding? Do you know my wife? Uh, and he didn't mean that in a derogatory way. He's thankful. And so Eve would have, you know, spiritually been connected to her husband. And so she helped him physically, spiritually, emotionally. And may I say, you as a wife should be your husband's biggest accountability partner. You know him better than anyone except the Lord. And so we'll talk about that more in, in lessons to come yet. She was to help Adam in his walk with God. She's not to be his mother. She's not to be his Holy Spirit. But she is to help him. And he is to help her. And so, ladies, the spiritual aspect of their relationship would become very vital after their sin. Sin separated them, right? From God and the perfect relationship that they had with him. One man brings out four crucial truths that I think are very important uh, regarding Eve's creation that we would do well to mention. Number one, and I think we need to keep this in mind, Eve was equal with Adam. She was equal. Just as the father and the son are equal, Adam and Eve were equal. They have different roles. And I hope you understand your role as a woman. Matthew Henry said this, The woman was made out of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side 
to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be beloved, end of quote. And ladies, even as we come to the New Testament, we see in Galatians 3.28 where Paul says, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And so Adam and Eve before God are created equal. Secondly, I think an important thing to remember is Eve reminds us that there should be unity in a marriage. Ladies, when you get married... You are not in a covenant relationship with your children. <laughs> you are in a covenant with your husband. I remember when our 13, well, she's not 13 now. She's going to be 41 next Sunday. But uh, when she was 13 and uh, she told her father no, she'd never told her father no. And uh, he looked at me and he goes, uh, what do we do now? She just, she just told me no. And I said, I don't know. So he sent her to her room and we talked and he, she came downstairs and he says, you got three days. You can abide by the rules of this home or see ya. I'm in a covenant relationship with your mother and you will not destroy this home. Now, thankfully the Lord broke her. She repented and she came to faith in Christ and now we're the best of friends. So that was a good deal. But Eve shows us that that's what God intended. Unity is ideal in marriage. And ladies, your relationship with your husband should be above all relationships. That's why he says in here, for this reason, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, glued. The Hebrew word is glued. She'd be glued to his wife and they are one flesh. Thirdly, her creation is an illustration of how deep and meaningful the husband and wife relationship is intended to be. And then lastly, her creation is an important lesson for us in the role of women. Ladies, we need to remember the order of creation. This is very important. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, man is not made for the woman, but woman for the man. Man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And he says in chapter 11, verse 3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of, man, of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. There's an order to creation. And why am I bringing this out? Because we would do well to take heed to that because in our age, women more and more are trying to take control. They're trying to rule and not just in the church, but in government and in all aspects of life. And ladies, we would do well to remember the order of creation. So what can we learn from here? Extraordinary beauty. What is the principle here? Well, what does the Bible say, right? That's why I say, what does the Bible say? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible says. Charm is, beaut charm is deceptive and beauty is what? Vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she will be praised. It says in 1 Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the what? The heart. Ladies, listen very carefully because we live in an age of narcissism. You know, people glaring at themselves in the mirror time, how beautiful they are. And, you know, we're, we're obsessed with ourselves. We're obsessed with our bodies. We're obsessed with that. Outward beauty is vain. It's vain. Fearing God is the virtue that God is looking for. In fact, in the next lesson, we're going to see, right? He's looking for that attitude of a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And so we need to be very careful. Eve obviously did not fear God, did she? She didn't fear him. She might have been a beautiful creature, maybe the most beautiful woman in all the world. But she did not fear God. She disobeyed him. So all was perfect. <laughs> perfect woman, perfect helper, perfect companion. And then something happened and it wasn't perfect. Eve, when this is your V, she was very, very deceived. She was very, very deceived. Look at verse chapter three. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And by the way, when it says, when the serpent said to her, it, to the woman, the Hebrew there is, he said to the woman being alone. In other words, she was alone. Adam was not with her. So he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said, oh, we can eat of the trees of the garden, but a fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we can't eat it. 
For in the day we touch it, we will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. God knows in the day you eat it, your eyes are going to be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make her wise, she took and she ate it. And she gave it to her husband and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called Adam and said, where are you? Where are you, Adam? He said, I, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked, God said. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And what the man said, <laughs> that, that woman, <laughs> that woman, she did it. She gave me that tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? What have you, what have you done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now ladies, as we think about Eve being deceived, it's interesting to point out as I mentioned, according to the Hebrew, the husband wasn't with her when the serpent beguiled her. And this is a principle that we would do well to listen and take heed to as women. If you are married, your husband is a great protection for you, spiritually and physically. Had Adam been with her when the serpent tempted her, it may not have happened. Now we know God is sovereign. We don't know what he was doing at this time. He may have been out looking at the animals. He probably wasn't that far away from her. He was probably looking at the animals. Maybe he was, you know, still enamored with this beautiful woman. And so maybe he was picking flowers. I, we don't know what he was doing. The text doesn't say. And maybe Eve didn't fully understand the commandment. Maybe if Adam had been there, he would have explained again to her, like, we can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve, we can't do this. God said, if we do this, we're going to die. And I don't know what death is, but it doesn't sound like it's a good deal, Eve. So let's not do this. Come on over here, Eve. Let's go look at these animals. Let's go, go here. But it didn't go that way. Eve did not consult her husband with what the serpent said. She did not seek his wisdom and his headship, which God so graciously had put over her. Instead, what'd she do? She listened to the voice of the charmer and believed his lies. Adam disobeyed. Eve was deceived. In fact, do you know what's interesting? The only New Testament passages that we have regarding Eve, two of them, talk about her being deceived. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul says, says this, Oh, I wish that you would bear with me in a little folly. Indeed, bear with me. I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, he says. I have betrothed you to one husband so that I can present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But he says, I fear, at least just like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so she's used there as an illustration of being deceived, and he's concerned about the church at Corinth, how their minds are being deceived, they're corrupted. And then in 1 Timothy 2, where Paul says, this is the second time, that it's the only second time in the scriptures in the New Testament that Eve is mentioned, where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. And she fell into transgression. Ladies, there is a warning for us as women in these New Testament passages as well as the passage in Genesis chapter 3. We are the weaker vessel, and I hope that you accept that about yourself. 1 Peter 3 is very clear. The wives are the weaker vessel, and we are more apt to be deceived than men are. Do you know that the statistics about women being led away by false teachers is astronomical? Women are the primary target. And we shouldn't be uh, surprised by that, right? The scriptures tell us 
that women are easy prey. That's why when I teach and I try earnestly to encourage women, get in the Bible. Put away that devotional fluff puff. Get into the Word. You don't want to be deceived. Listen, in the last year, I've probably talked to more women than I've talked to throughout the whole time that I've been doing this that have, are coming out of false teaching. They've listened to the charmer, the voice of the charmer, and false teachers love to prey on women. Paul says in 2 Timothy, know this, in the last times, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, tradey, headers, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it from such turn away. And listen to this, for of these sort, these kind of people, we know what they do? They creep into houses and they lead captive silly women led away with various lusts. Ladies, it behooves us to be women of the scripture. What is going to keep you from error? What's going to keep you from being deceived by those doctrines of demons, seducing spirits? Eve was deceived. Did God really say? He didn't really say that. Go ahead. You can do it, Eve. Go ahead, eat of the fruit. As I mentioned, the statistics, men versus women being led away by false teachers is astronomical. But you know what else? I don't have this as a principle, but it is. She was also discontent, wasn't she? Can you imagine not being content in that world that God had made? But she was discontent. That was another reason she took of the fruit. So Eve believed the lie that if she ate the fruit, she would not die. Her eyes would be open. She would be like God, and she would know good from evil. So Eve, being very, very deceived, takes the advice of the master deceiver. She eats the forbidden fruit, and he gives it, she gives it to her husband, Adam. Paul tells us that this is when sin entered into the world, right? Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as by one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and death spread to all men because all have sinned. Now, ladies, I don't know why sin did not enter into the world when Eve partook of the fruit. I don't know. And we cannot draw, don't, do, not, do not draw from this passage, well, women are not accountable for their sin. That is not what the scriptures teach. You are accountable for your sin. But Adam was the head of his household, and he's more responsible for stopping the sin. In fact, I often tell women who are struggling with decisions that their husbands are making, God is not going to hold you responsible for the decisions your husband makes. But he is going to hold you responsible for your attitude of submission and respect for him. Ladies, Adam could have said, no, Eve, no, <laughs> You just ate, I'm not doing this. I am not going to eat this. What you just did was wrong, and I'm not going to have any part of it. I believe what God said. We're going to die. I don't know what death is, but we're going to die. But Adam wasn't strong enough, was he? He was not strong. Maybe he was still enamored with this absolutely beautiful creature called woman that God had given him. Maybe he couldn't resist her charm. Maybe he couldn't resist her manipulation, which by the way, we as women do have ways we manipulate, right? We do entice our husbands from time to time to do things. And ladies, Eve is a reminder to each of us the responsibility that we bear in enticing our husbands to sin. I know women and I've counseled them. They withhold uh, intimacy, give them the silent treatment, tears, empty threat. If you, if you don't do this, I'm gonna divorce you. Um, ladies, we cannot do that. We should never manipulate our husbands. So Eve being deceived by the serpent sin and then caused her husband to sin. Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband. He disobeyed and he ate it. They both sinned. Their eyes were open immediately and they knew they were naked. And what'd they have to do? <laughs> well, when you're naked, you want to cover yourself up, right? So they made fig leaves and covered themselves. Now, did God look favorably upon their disobedience? No. Just like he does not look favorably upon your disobedience. And so for our mother Eve, 
there were given some earthly curses that she would bear as well, pass, as well as she passed them on to us, her daughters, right? So this is the E on your acrostic, the next E. We can learn from some principles about the earthly curses. Let's read it together. Genesis 3, 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you're cursed above all cattle more than the beast of the field. On your belly you will go and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put in between, between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, he will bruise his head and you will bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in childbirth and conception. In pain you will bring forth children and your desire is going to be to rule your husband, but he will rule over you. Then he said, Dad, and because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you're going to eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it's going to bring for you, and you'll eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you're going to eat it until you return to the ground, for out of you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. And then Adam called his wife, went from woman to what? Eve. Because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now at least he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to go out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man. He placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what are Eve's earthly curses? What principles can we learn here? Well, she got three of them. You might say, well, I only see two. I'm going to give you a third one. Three earthly curses. Number one, very interesting. When I was memorizing this several months ago, I'd never noticed the multiplied pain in not only childbirth, but conception. Conception and childbirth, there will be pain. And she soon found out, even though the scriptures doesn't tell us about the pain she experienced when she delivered Cain and Abel, right? But she soon found out about that pain. And ladies, let me tell you, as a mother of grown children, that pain in childbirth keeps on going in their adult life, right? Uh, My kids are in their 40s now, but there's still pain in childbirth. And don't you imagine she was very sorrowful when her son Cain killed his brother Abel? There's still that pain in childbirth. But we all know that have had kids, there's pain in childbirth, right? Jesus says in the upper room to the disciples right before he goes to the cross, a woman when she is in labor has what? (laughs) She has sorrow, pain. But as soon as that son's delivered, she doesn't remember the pain anymore. But then he says, you will have sorrow, but I will see you again. So there is pain in childbirth. It's also interesting that after the curses are pronounced, Adam changes her name from woman to Eve, which is an indication that because of her sin entering into the world, she's now the mother of all living. She is the life giver. The second earthly curse she received is one we all know about, that oh, those of us that are married, the desire to rule our husbands, but guess what? They're going to rule over us. I don't have to give you a lot of detail about that. How many of you this last week wanted to, you know, rule your husband? And how many of you lied? All of you. I only saw one hand go up. We have a fleshly desire to control our husbands, right? We do. We want to control. You guys, I'm changing the name of this conference to lying now. So I have to pull out my teaching about lying. We do want to rule them, but they're going to rule us. And I want to just tell you, as a woman that's been married 46 years next month, you're going to have it the rest of your life, okay? It doesn't get any easier. Might get, you get better at not doing that, but you're always going to have that desire. And then the third curse that is not really mentioned, but it is there indirectly, she's going to bear Adam's curse, if you think about it, of his toil and labor for food for for them. Now that the ground is cursed, she's going to bear that curse. Why? 
because now her husband's going to have to work long hours in order to bring home food. In fact, we see from the Proverbs 31 woman, she even has to participate in that. Remember the Proverbs 31 woman? She stays up late. She gets up early. She considers a field. She buys it. I mean, this woman is hard working, right? And so indirectly, she does bear a little bit of his curse as well. You know what? Thank God these earthly curses that were pronounced upon this woman, they were not, they're not going to be everlasting. Ladies, Revelation 22, 3 says, when we get to heaven, there's going to be no more curse. <laughs> Those are all going to be gone, right? It's going to be glorious. It's going to be great. So what can we learn from Eve, the mother of all living, the mother of us all? First thing is extraordinary beauty. She was a woman of extraordinary beauty. Now you might say, well, Susan, that doesn't apply to me. I looked in the mirror this morning, and let me tell you, what I saw was far from extraordinary beauty. So that doesn't even apply to me. Maybe not. Even though none of us in this room, sorry, any of you that are narcissistic, you do not have a perfect body, you do not have perfect looks. You are created in the image of God, however. Are you thankful for the earthly body that God has given you? Now, you don't have a glorified body yet, but ladies, we would be wise not to complain about what we think we need to have in order to be this perfect woman. God created you the way you are. He gave you the body he gave you, and we need to be thankful for it. God doesn't care about your dress size. He cares about your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on their, your heart. Doesn't care if you're wearing the latest fashions. Doesn't care about your, your hair. He cares about you being clothed with righteousness. Remember, charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord, she will be praised. The second thing we learned about her is she's very, very deceived. Are you protecting yourself from being deceived by Satan by seeking advice from your spiritual head, your head. Could be your husband, could be your father, could be church leadership if you're single. Are you a woman who knows the word and can be discerning when the charmer comes? Or are you like these gullible women that Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy that are led away by false teachers? Ladies, I cannot emphasize again, and I will probably emphasize this all weekend, the importance of studying, reading, and memorizing the word. John says that in the last days, what false Christs and false prophets, he talks about how they're going to increase. Jesus talks about it in the Olivet Discourse. False Christs, false prophets are going to increase. And if possible, deceive the very elect. It's not possible, but they're going to try to deceive us. We as women do not have the luxury of wasting our life away on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, television, entertainment, and mindless activities. We must be women of the word. So we will not be swept away into sin. Do not think you are above being tempted by the evil one. Take heed lest you fall, right? Take heed. Thirdly, earthly curses. Eve's sin brought two direct curses to her and one indirect curse. What if Eve had never sinned? What kind of a world would you and I live in today? What if you and I would never sin? What difference would that make in your home, in our world, in the church? Ladies, I would encourage you sometime when you have a little bit of extra reading time in the Word, read Deuteronomy 28, the whole chapter. Look at all the blessings of obedience and the curses for disobedience. That's a great motivation to put off sin. Even though there were these earthly curses pronounced upon Eve, there's also a promise. I love it. When God said to Satan in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed, your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What was this? The promise that Eve's seed would bruise the serpent's head. Out of Eve would come eventually what? Jesus Jesus Christ, the one who would crush Satan's head. 
Even though we sinned grossly, God who is rich in mercy gave her a promise that from her seed would come the one to bruise Satan's head. Ladies, because we too have grossly sinned. Paul says, you know, you who were once dead in trespasses and sins, he's made alive, right? He's made us alive. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has made us alive, right? For by grace have we been saved, right? And he's raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ladies, Eve sinned, just as we also sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, can save us from that, right? Save us from our sin. If you are like Eve this evening, that is, your sin has separated you from God, I would encourage you, if you're hiding in guilt and shame because of your sin, there is hope. (laughs) And the hope is what? Christ. He is our only hope, right? And if you have never repented of your sins, if you have never turned away from your evil ways, if you are now separated from God, ladies, I would encourage you to believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried, he rose again according to the scriptures. And he will come again and he will judge the living and the dead. Realize that you're a great sinner and you need a savior. You need a savior, you need Christ. And I would encourage you to repent. If you are a believer and you're engrossed in some life-dominating sin, I would encourage you, confess your sins. (laughs) He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Eve has some lessons for us, right? She was very deceived, extraordinary, beautifully, beautiful. And she gave us some earthly curses. Well, imagine this. Imagine living in a world where there's no sin. (laughs) No one dies, no one gets sick. No murders, no robberies, no rapes, no sexual or physical abuse, no jealousy, envy, strife, or hatred. Everyone gets along with each other. Animals, humans, everyone's in intimate communion with the Father. No separation from Him, constant companionship, constant fellowship. Imagine this. This was the world before sin. And ladies, for those of you that know Christ, this will be the world that we will one day enjoy with God in heaven. (laughs) For those of us who know the creator of the universe, heaven awaits us, a world free of sorrow and pain and curses. (laughs) A place of bliss unknown with not only Eve, the mother of us all, but most importantly, the father of us all, our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for the lessons we can learn from Eve. We know that these things are written for our learning, and Lord, how we as women need to learn from her. Some in this room may be, have extraordinary beauty outwardly, but maybe their heart is corrupted with evil. I pray for them. I pray that all of us, Lord, would examine not our outward beauty, but our inward heart to make sure that we are free from corruption and sin. Our consciences are clear before you. I also pray for any in this room tonight, Lord, that are being deceived by the evil one. We know that as the end comes, that there will be more and more doctrines of demons, seducing spirits out there. Paul even mentions forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods even. And Lord, I don't know what, there seems like there's new ones every day, but I pray these women would be wise and be in your word so they would not be led away by the evil one. And then, Father, I pray that we'd realize, just as Eve gave us these curses that are with us even now, today, pain and childbirth, wanting to rule our husbands, that, Lord, our examples to our children, when our daughters and our sons see us as mothers sinning, We are passing on poor examples that they too will follow. So Father, I pray that we be wise in our decisions, wise in our speech, wise in our conduct, that our conduct would be that that becomes the gospel. 
So we give the rest of this evening to you, and I pray for our fellowship time. And as we come back in a little bit and look at our submissive sister, Sarah, Lord, we pray that we can learn as well from her. Thank you again in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.